When you think of all the physiological steps that have to occur to start a successful pregnancy, it is a wonder it happens at all. Sometimes, though, it does not. Tonight, we look at fertility. The doctors are on call tonight. Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by... The South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation. Good evening and welcome to On Call Television. Tonight the show is about the challenge of conception. Why is it that, try as they might, some couples find it impossible to become pregnant? One of nature's most cruel jokes is that when unwanted pregnancies seem to abound, other people would give their right arms to become parents. We know that something like 12% of women in the childbearing age have trouble getting or staying pregnant and that infertility is caused one-third of the time by male problems, one-third of the by female problems, and one-third by a combination or an unknown cause. Recently, science has uncovered many of the reasons why couples remain barren despite all their usual efforts to become pregnant. This medical field helps define the causes for infertility and ways to fix it, appears in a remarkable state of growth. To answer your questions about the causes and treatment for infertility, we have invited an unusual pair of experts. Dr. Keith Hansen, originally from Wall, South Dakota, completed his undergraduate degree at Carroll College in Helena, Montana, his medical school at Washington U in St. Louis, and his residency training from the Department of OBGYN at the Naval Hospital, Portsmouth VA. His fellowship was at the National Institutes of Health. He has professional interests in infertility and advanced reproductive technologies and in vitro fertilization at the Sanford USD School of Medicine and is a professor and chair of the department of OBGYN at the Sanford School of Medicine USD and is presently the editor of the South Dakota Journal of Medicine. Mike McHale, Dr. McHale, originally from, uh, originally from Omaha, Nebraska, completed his undergraduate degree at St. John's University in Collegeville, Minnesota. His medical school and an internal medicine training at the University of Nebraska College of Medicine in Omaha. His fellowship in hematology and oncology at Indiana University, Indianapolis and is the Clinical Associate Professor of Internal Medicine and Division Chief of Hematology, Sanford USD School of Medicine. He established the McHale Institute in 2002, later joining the Avera Medical Group, and there provides cancer and oncology care, as well as diagnostic and treatment of disorders of the blood, including clotting disorders. Because maintaining a pregnancy involves the complex balance of the clotting system, Dr. McHale and Dr. Hansen have been collaborating for years over the care of women threatened with miscarriages and thus the unusual match of guests tonight, a fertility expert with a hematologist. Please call in your questions about tonight's topic. We'll take anything about uh, miscarriages, we'll talk about fertility, men's side, female side, call us at one 888 
376-6225. You may also email them to questions at oncalltelevision.com. Gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Thank so, you. So when I asked you guys, I think two years ago, you said, well, we could do one on miscarriages. And I said, Mikhail, what are you talking about? Miscarriages, what in the world? You're a hematologist, an oncologist. And, um, but we have you together tonight. It's an interesting thing. When did you get started working on uh, uh, fertility and hematology? I saw a few patients and he started sending some people over that uh, he realized it wasn't hormonal or it wasn't physical or you know organ involved it was something going on with the, I'll call it a hypercoagulability. There's an increased tendency of a woman to form a clot and you know lose the baby by losing the placenta. So, but now every pregnant woman their their clotability, you know, their that's that that's a made up word. Their ability to clot seems to change, doesn't it? I mean, that's this magical thing that happens in the, in the woman's body that they don't bleed to death, but yet they don't clot to death either. It changes. Explain that a little bit. A lot of times it has to do with estrogen levels in your body. Estrogens uh, help keep blood vessels tight like that. But there's other people who have hereditary problems and some acquired problems uh, that make them want to have clots. So. Yes, there are a lot of hormonal reasons for why you want to clot, but there's a lot of inherited diseases, also um, bleeding disorders that happen that women don't understand too. All right, and Keith, uh, that's interesting. You had a long road to this position, uh, this uh, National Institutes of Health experience. Tell me a little bit about that. Well, that was uh, my fellowship in reproductive endocrinology, and it, um, it was a two-year fellowship at that time, since that dates me. It's now three years. Um, but it really was a very fascinating um, opportunity because we dealt with endocrine problems from all sorts of different walks of life, including reproductive endocrine problems and women with infertility and miscarriages and thyroid disease and Cushing's and I mean, every in, you sound like an internist. Now you're an OBGYN, that's a, kind of a surgical specialty, but you're talking right. internal medicine diseases. Right, we had lots of patients with all sorts of metabolic and endocrine diseases like short stature and you know little kids with precocious puberty with one-year-olds with completely developed and it was a very fascinating place to be you know because all the patients get set there from all over the world. So what brought you back to South Dakota? Well actually um, after the Navy I went to the uh, Medical College of Georgia down in Augusta, Georgia and then after that there was an opening up at um, in Sioux Falls and we moved up to Sioux Falls then to get closer to home and stuff so. You spent some time in Georgia like I did then? Yes, five years. It's a good place. It was. Augusta, you know, the Nationals. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, you know, we were married in April when the dogwoods were in bloom and it was just absolutely just beautiful, beautiful, beautiful. But it's, and that I'm saying this in January in South Dakota because it's <laughs> So it's glad to have you here. Let's talk about um, the, the issues of uh, fertility just off the ball. What would be the most common scenario that you see? Well, from a fertility perspective, the most common we see is a couple who've been you know, trying to conceive for a number of years or a year and then have been unsuccessful. And as you already mentioned earlier, you know, about a third of the time it's the male, a third of the time it's the female, and then the other third it's a combination of the two. So we do see quite a few patients with all sorts of different problems, either in sperm production or egg production or getting the two together. Um, I said 12% have trouble getting pregnant. With all of the technology and all the work and all the things that we can do to help them, what number do we get that down, that 12% down to? We probably get that down to more like about two to three percent. But really, it, that 10% yeah. we can really get them there. Mm -hmm. Do we have to always go with all this expensive technology? I mean, that's the question I would have. No, sometimes it's simple. Sometimes it's very easy to help somebody to get pregnant. Well, relatively easy. It's yeah. not easy, but relatively easy to get them pregnant. Like if they're not ovulating to give them an oral medication, they'll ovulate and then be able to get pregnant or help them by you know, doing what's called the intrauterine insemination where we take their partner's sperm and inject it right up inside the uterus and get the sperm closer and they're able to get pregnant that way. One of the things I, I talked about was that if you could get the mom and the 
bad to live a healthier lifestyle. It makes things better. How important is that, do you think? Oh, it's very critical. It's one of the, you know, um, depending on the reason that they're having troubles getting pregnant, that can be the whole problem. Um, as Dr. McHale said earlier, smoking, smoking is really bad for fertility too, as is chewing tobacco. Oh, chewing wow. tobacco is terrible for sperm. You know, it's got, I forget what percentage of cyanide is in that. Mm -hmm. Would you ever put your little baby in cyanide, you know? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, it's like, yeah, they need to stop that. And you hear all these stories about gals saying they get pregnant and then they'll stop smoking. They need to stop smoking before they get pregnant. It's kind of the folic acid story. They'll reduce their risk of all sorts of problems if they can just stop using tobacco way before they get pregnant. Right. We know that that, and that's the, it, the thing that gets me is the, the vast majority of that baby is formed almost before the mother knows that she's pregnant. Definitely. Um, uh, so how important is the dad? I, this may not be your territory, but I think it is. I think you know in general these answers. How important is it, Mike, that the dad be healthy? It's very important for just, I mean, just sperm counts. I mean, normal sperm counts, what, 30 or 50 million, whatever, and you get a number like that. Uh, uh, you have other problems, health problems that can go down. Like, and in, in you have a certain type of cancer, your your sperm count will go down. So you want to stay healthy enough, you don't get a malignancy of some type. I mean, there's a classic articles in the past about uh, in testicular carcinoma. You know, typically their uh, their sperm count is next to nothing, or they're not motile or have problems at the time of diagnosis. So keep yourself healthy, so you don't develop any of these diseases. Yeah. I I have uh, read uh, in this territory called epigenics, which is to me, just so fascinating. And I'd like to have you guys expound on this, but there is some data that says, you know, that, it, it, that, that if a man is smoking, a man is smoking, his grandchildren and great-grandchildren are terribly affected by that. And if a man is overweight, his grandchildren, great-grandchildren are affected by that or, or become, uh, excessively, uh, I think the studies were in Finland or something like that, where they overate after starvation and that the people who really, really overate, their great-grandchildren did poorly. Now, take me, take, explain that. Well, it's a fascinating area where they, you know, where it gets passed on epigenetically and we're finding out that it's a lot more common than we thought it was. It originally started, like you said, out of the after World War II where they had the prisoner of war camps and the ghettos, the Warsaw Ghetto where people were starved to death and then afterwards would, you know, replenish themselves, you know, and replenish. Over much. Over, yes. overdo it. <laughs> and they were finding that their babies were at higher risk when they were born of developing diabetes later in life and such. And now with other um, agents like cigarette smoking and, you know, there's a guy actually talking that it might increase the risk of cancer for, for children. You know, it's amazing all the stuff they're finding out with, you know, epigenetics and what it changes and yeah. how far down it may go. It's almost like switches being turned on and off. Right. It, 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 it's, it's like we, we've often said uh, that we give them our, our, our genetic code that we inherited from our parents, you know, and then their environment that they live in is what makes the difference. And the truth is the environment that we live in can change what's happened to our children, that, that it's, it's, uh, it changes the Darwinian theory and the uh, Lenex theory. Lamarck. Lamarck, that's yeah, it. Right. Lenex was the stethoscope. Lamarck was <laughs> yeah. the guy with the giraffes. The giraffes got exactly. long necks because they changed their environment. Well, any other comments before we take a quick little switch? Just a lot of chromosomal problems are switches. You know, things get turned on, things get turned off, and that's how all these things happen. It's an amazing new world that we're learning. The science opens up the door and we change our, our uh, opinions about things. It isn't pure Darwinian anymore. Well, considering the number of physiological processes that have to happen at just the right time and in perfect sequence to create a successful pregnancy, it's a wonder it ever happens. There are a number of tests that can look into the reasons for problems with infertility. Our on-call crew visited a local facility that offers leading-edge science that gives insight into male, male infertility. I was 
the uh, father of this uh, concept was Permadini fragmentation, and uh, it was derived initially from my work at when I was at co-faculty with uh, Sloan Kettering Cancer Center in New York and Cornell Medical School. There's uh, uh, now considerable evidence that uh, various environmental factors um, uh, cause DNA damage. Uh, for example, we did a study in Mexico from uh, pesticide operators, uh, young guys who uh, had a very high level of damage uh, just from the uh, exposure to the pesticides. A couple who's experienced infertility, uh, usually the wife goes to the uh, reproductive endocrinologist first and uh, uh, to various tests, and then it's usually just they send the husband over to the urology clinic for a standard semen analysis. This analysis consists of light microscope assay for sperm count, motility, and morphology. However, the light microscope is looking at the, just the exterior of a cell. We're looking inside the genome, uh, which is the, obviously the half of the genome of the embryo. And we're looking for DNA damage or DNA strand breaks. And if a, if a DNA is broken in a region of a gene, that's, re that's necessary for uh, uh, paternal uh, uh, information for the embryo to grow. If that's broken, then the embryo dies. Samples come from a clinic. The man has a certain level of damage. He says, okay, now what do I do? And uh, there's various things. One, um, uh, we send the uh, man to urologist who checks for what's called a varicocele. A varicocele is an abnormal uh, it's a valve in the, uh, the blood flow to the testis. And of course, this reason men have a scrotum is that the testis should be two degrees cooler than the body temperature in order to make good sperm. So if this blood flow uh, causes increase in temperature. So that can be fixed. Other things like uh, radiation, uh, x-rays, and uh, some of those, they make, some can make permanent damage. And we know of uh, cases where uh, even from chemotherapy, it's, uh, the, the, the sperm are totally, uh, the stem cells are totally damaged, there's no recovery. We have worked with um, cancer patients, and cancer patients that come in usually have a, uh, a uh, deteriorated level of sperm DNA quality just from the disease itself. And so these samples are often then banked, uh, and then later on, a year or two, hoping that the chemotherapy wasn't severe enough so that they will then uh, have normal spermatogenesis come back, we compare the sample at that time, say so be two years later, with the sample that was frozen. And whichever is one best, they then may use for uh, uh, trying to have a child. There are some clinics that say, we don't care what the problem is, how it is, we're gonna use this new innovation called intercytoplasmic sperm injection, which stands ICSI. They simply find a sperm, uh, inject it into the egg, and they say, if you got a sperm, you fix the problem. Not true. Uh, although that's a efficient way of causing a pregnancy, uh, there are ways that you can fix this problem so you still have the child naturally. And that would be um, uh, things like uh, reducing body weight, BMI, uh, eating pr properly with uh, emphasis on antioxidants. The bottom line of damage is caused by what's called oxidative stress. We live in an oxygen environment and th uh, that's, we need that, but there's a side, a downside to that of having uh, free radicals coming off of that by, by just the oxygen or by other factors, and it's the free radical that breaks the DNA. We found that on the average, when a man reaches 50 years of age, that he will have 25% of the sperm with fragmented DNA. This is the clinical threshold. When, one is, when a man has more than 25% of sperm um, uh, damage, we say he statistically placed into the category of a longer time to pregnancy, uh, more miscarriages, or no pregnancy. As far as the process, um, uh, most of our samples are received from clinics. So a sperm lab, probably for uh, standard semen analysis, and then they will then take an aliquot of that, put it into a little vial, and then uh, flash freeze it, put in um, liquid nitrogen or uh, dry ice, send it to us, and then we um, measure that sample within a day or so. Uh, we send the data back uh, through a secure website, so the doctor will have the results within a couple of days. When the sample comes in, the sample is uh, thawed, and then the critical step is that we treat the sperm with a low 
uh, pH for 30 seconds. This low pH then allows the double-stranded DNA where there's a break to open up. We use a dye called acridine orange. This insulates into double-stranded nucleic acid, normal DNA, and it fluoresces green under a blue laser light. However, if it's broken, then the acridine orange stacks on that single strand, it collapses into a crystal, and when that blue laser light hits that, there's a metachromatic shift to red fluorescence. The more red fluorescence, the greater the amount of DNA strand breaks. We measure the individual, individual cells, 5,000 5, sperm per sample, and we can tell every, what, every single sperm, single sperm, has with regard to its integrity of DNA. Here are two examples of uh, different patient results. This one is, uh, here's the sperm that is sitting here, green fluorescence, which means uh, it's uh, got good DNA integrity, and virtually no cells that have DNA fragmentation. So this would get a score of being excellent. In sharp contrast, you see this man had most of his cells with DNA, uh, DNA damage. I think the bottom line message is that if, for example, you have uh, not had success, I mean, the, the couple appears to be okay in terms of the, the female doctor and the male doctor, there's no pregnancy within six to eight months. They should have a test like this here because this is probably 25% of the problems that we alone by this technology can detect. Wow, thank you Dr. Evenson for that wonderful example of uh, how you study male fertility. And it's some very interesting thing. Welcome back to On Call. Tonight we have Dr. Keith Hansen with Sanford Health Fertility and Reproductive Medicine and Dr. Mike McHale with the Avera Medical Group McHale Institute as our guest. Please call your questions about tonight's topic. We really need your questions. Give us a call, 1-888-376-6225. That's 1-888-376-6225. And you can also email them on oncalltelevision.com. Look to questions at oncall. So your reactions, Mike. Oh, that was, that was a good talk about uh, chemotherapy induced problems. Uh, I mean, I have people who, I think you just saw a patient of mine the other day who mm -hmm. has a malignancy and I'm getting all the final path reports to figure out what he's got before I, I do something bad to him with, say, chemotherapy. I mean, functionally, he may be aspermic right now, but if I do something bad to him with chemotherapy, I'm gonna drop his counts down. And he you know, can't realistically you know, think about fertilizing anything, any, any, any recent history. So I have him come and see Keith, and they do semen analysis, and they do sperm banking for that. So that's important for you know, males of reproductive age or who want to be reproductive to be thinking about that, because I'll do bad things to the sperm with chemotherapy. So you, when they're getting the chemo, the sperm are wiped out for a while, and they sometimes don't come back. Right. Sometimes they come back, though. Right. But it's worth it to, to, to bank some. It's an excellent thing you should be doing. You should be coming and talk to us to be referred to Keith to have this done. I mean, that's the smart thing to do when you're young. This gentleman is 31 who went and saw you the other day, so it's smart to do that. Um, your response to Dr. Evenson's point? Well, Dr. Evenson, we've worked with him for for probably 15 years since ever since I came to South Dakota, and he's really been an incredible leader in this whole area. And the one nice thing about it is it really does give you a great idea about how good the sperm will work. And then also, it also tends to correlate with miscarriage also. So if a guy has a really high DNA fragmentation, it tend, those women tend to have a higher rate of miscarriage even if they are able to become pregnant. It's amazing, he's got offices in Copenhagen and Paris and Hong Kong and I mean, and his main office is Volga, South Dakota. And exactly. He is like, there's one or two other people in the world that are at our, uh, at his level, our level, our Donna even, Evenson. Now, you know, he's, what's interesting is other places have tried to replicate this. They, they feel like, like the guys at Boston went in and they tried to set up a lab and they, you know, they feel they can just turn the machine on, stick the sample in and it'll come out. Well, Dr. Evenson, you know, he sits down and he calibrates his machine every day and tests it and, you know, he's really done an incredible job and so, when his result, they didn't, they weren't able to replicate his findings, so they say it's not any good. Well, I would argue that it's not the findings, it's the setting up everything and doing the assay right that gives you the good results. So we're very fortunate to have him. Yes, we are. 
Uh, I thought that whole issue about uh, the age uh, uh, of males at 50 years of age, that's a cutoff. And he's basically saying that there's problem. That doesn't mean that you're after 50, you can't make babies and, and that you're infertile, but there's problems there at 50. Yeah, so as you get older, things start to go downhill, I'm afraid. Yeah. But, I, even yeah. though that's pretty young. Yeah, but the telomeres start shorting. The ends of your, yeah. your chromosomes start shortening and becoming more fragile. And the, I mean, as you get older, they are not as functional as they were. I mean, yes. You can still get pregnant at any age, but uh, the chromosomes are not working as well as they have. Yeah, and I think at 50, somewhere around 50, uh, a terrible uh, thing happened to me. It just totally uh, made me w uh, our, our sperm to be dysfunctional. It's this thing called vasectomy. <laughs> that was a joke. Yeah. I'm glad you laughed. <laughs> that was a planned. Don't be fertile. Well, they still work. They just can't get there. Yeah. So that's, that's right. right. They just they're they're being made. Yeah. I'm yeah, really you know, a man, but you're just not. They're not getting there, are they? Exactly. But at age 60, one of the problems is is the risk of autosomal dominant mutations go up as a guy gets older, above 60. Talking like, um, you know, Huntington's, Korea, and those kind of diseases. All so. of the diseases happen uh, not only when the eggs get older, but the sperm get older, and that's the take home. Yeah. Um, so. But the, you know, if you want to age your sperm too, that's the other thing. Don't take care of your body. All of these toxins that you can take in, including, like you say, the tobacco, uh, it makes those sperm less functional. Definitely. A question here uh, from Brookings: Are there any risks with it, uh, with using special fertility methods to get pregnant? Risks. Well, there, um, all the special fertility methods that we use do have risk. Probably the biggest one that you may have heard of, it was this story out of California, Octomom. You know, okay. the having more than one baby is yeah. the biggest problem. Eight we have babies. a, yeah, yeah we try not to avoid that. Actually, after Octomom, the American Society of Reproductive Medicine and got octomom together. Octomom means eight babies, right? I mean, right, eight. Eight, eight. Yeah. octa. Eight. Yep. Yeah, and so what they did was they went back and they actually figured out what is the, you know, the optimal number to put in to achieve a successful pregnancy. And for most women, that's one or two. It's not six or eight. Um, and so I think that's one of the biggest risk is um, multiple babies from pretty much everything we do. The other risk is something called ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, which actually they can get right. really hypercoagulable with that. So. Let's hear about that. Well, typically, uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome, I think your estradiol levels are like 10 times higher than normal. Typically, they're clots in the neck and the arm. It's not a clot in your arm, on your leg or anything like that. You get clots in your arm. I remember receiving a phone call from uh, one of the emergency room one night. They said, this woman's in here, got a clot in her arm. I said, what's she doing? Well, she's on these medications to make her pregnant. So no big deal. It's ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. Don't worry about it. We'll take care of it. But clot typically in the arm happens from this. You know, uh, the, if, a, if a woman who is pregnant gets clots, you're going to want to treat those blood clots so they don't flip to the lung or they don't cause them major problems. The arm clots don't generally go to the lung, correct? Well, yes, I've they seen, can, but they don't, yeah. They don't generally. I've seen one, but they don't generally. But how do you treat them? You're going to have to treat them with blood thinners. Can you do that safely in a pregnant woman? Yes. I mean, low molecular weight heparin is a treatment of choice now, not unfractionated heparin. Unfractionated heparin has a very short half-life, had to give a lot of it. Uh, low molecular heparin, you just give once a day, twice a day, something like that. It's very safe. Uh, it doesn't go across anything. It's not going to cause problems to the baby. I mean, you treat someone with a, a, a new clot just like you would treat anybody else. With But you're on heparin. You don't go on Coumadin. You're, so Coumadin is out in a pregnant woman. Yes. So they need to have. Now, what about the new anticoagulant, oral anticoagulants? Uh, are they usable for pregnant women? The direct thrombin inhibitors, they're called the DTIs. Uh, um, oh, I can't believe it, but they're, they're the DTIs are, are and the, the anti-10A level uh, drugs are. There's a new anti-10A, it's anti-10A as a, it works on factor 10 and blocks it, but those drugs are safe in pregnancy. You can use those. I mean, they've just come out, and the, the DTIs just came out within the last year. The 10A I just heard about just recently. I mean, they're, they work quite well. Now, are you gonna use them in pregnancy? Well, no. They're because new. You they're don't new. Know. Well, the and the DTIs, direct thrombin inhibitors, are only indicated in atrial fibrillation, and I think one of them just has a new indication for pulmonary emboli, and class that, but they're not indicated for a clot in your leg. 
you know, you get clots in the leg because the placenta crosses the left iliac vein, which crosses crosses over the right ovarian artery or something like that, which makes them more supple clots in their legs. Okay. But then uh, what about when they get close to delivery? Well, close to delivery, you've got, uh, you know, low molecular weight heparin, typically uh, anoxaparin, has a half-life of about seven hours. You know, it takes about five half-lives to get rid of 95% of the drug. So you don't want to give a shot in the morning and start so going seven to, hours times five. 35 hours for roughly for a drug, 95% of the drug to get out, and that's statistically it's gone from your body. So what you want to do close to the time, you know, if you can predict a delivery, okay, yeah. you want to yeah. put them Predicting on. Predicting the delivery, he said, <laughs> R-O-B-G-Y-N laughs. <laughs> you, put them on, you put them on unfractured heparin, which is a half-life of about an hour. So within, you know, five, six hours, it's gone from your body. So you want to kind of, you know, try and predict. But a lot of times in the hypercoagulable women who, you know, I know are going to have problems, I'll try and figure out a date. You know, come back and see me at 38 weeks and we'll switch you over from low molecular weight heparin to unfractured heparin. The problem with- Regular heparin in, in, a, in, a, in a drip form or? No, just sub-Q. Okay. Uh, the problem with low molecular weight heparin is kind of like a fire and forget drug. You just kind of give it and it should be therapeutic. You really don't check a level until being a third trimester because as you gain weight, your dose may go up. Unfractured heparin, uh, you're gonna check anti-10A levels frequently. Typically, I think it's about six hours after a dose to make sure you're therapeutic. So there's a lot more of a hassle getting blood tests done and yeah. changing doses and things like that. Right. And the reason we do that is because, you know, they have to stop when they deliver because that's what blood, you know, because we need them to clot then. Yes, we do. <laughs> yeah, we need them to clot big uh, time. Uh, now let's, yeah, because if they aren't clotting and they deliver that baby, they can bleed to death. I mean, that's exactly. what happens to a lot of, you know, it used to happen a lot more than it does now. Oh, it did. It was one of the top causes of death in the bad past. Keith, you know, if I look at those 12% and we get everybody exercising and eating correctly, um, and now we're going to start to do the things, what are the things that we do? Are there like three or four things and what percentage of the time do they work? And let, let's just use that. Most of the time the climb of plant, just go through the list. Okay, well, first of all, we usually start out with test. You know, the first test, one of the tests we do is the sperm count, as Dr. Evenson said, um, the light microscope version. And then we do a, um, a test of the uterus and fallopian tubes to make sure that the uterus is normal and the tubes are open, because that's important to get, okay. And also, we test the ovaries to make sure how they're working. Then what we do is try to decide how to treat them. If they're not ovulating, we'll give them medicines to help them ovulate, like clomiphene citrate. So you can tell if they're not ovulating. I'm Correct, right. usually just by talking to them. Women who don't ovulate will have very irregular periods. You know, they'll come in and say, look, I get a period once every six months. Right. Well, then I know they're not ovulating. Right. Um, and so then I can treat them with clomid or something like that. Or if they have a um, blocked tubes, then we have to talk about, do we do surgery to try to unblock the tubes? or do we go on to in vitro fertilization and bypass the tubes? So the test really guides you. Exactly, they help us to figure out exactly what to do and such. All right, and the percentage of causes, if you were gonna cut them down, tube blockage, the biggest percentage? Yeah, that's, well, it depends on where you're located. Um, and inner city see, troubles more, yeah, more time. Yeah, and inner city, it's more like fallopian tube problems. And then um, it's probably about 25 to, um, 35 percent is fallopian tubes and 30 percent is the ovaries and you know the rest is male factor and unexplained. And the clotting factor causing miscarriage is what? Well the workup for miscarriage is a little bit different. Now there's both you know there's sporadic miscarriages which I'm afraid happen quite frequently. They're 15 to 20 percent of the time a person can have just have an uh, by chance have a miscarriage. And then there's patients that can have repetitive miscarriages or, or recurrent pregnancy loss. And that, thank goodness, doesn't happen very often, but it's less than 1% of the time. And that's the clotting. That's the clotting problems. And there's other ones like chromosomal problems, uterine defects, um, and then clotting problems can be a really big issue in there too. All right. The arrival of a baby can be a wondrous, joyous occasion. It's anticipated for months and the excitement of family and friends bring the preparation new excitement. Tragically, approximately 20% of pregnancies can end in a miscarriage. When this happens, there is not only a physical response, but an emotional one as well. 
When families experience the loss of an infant, um, as care providers, we not only um, tend to their physical needs, but also their emotional and their spiritual needs as well. Um, each, each family copes differently, so um, we make sure that we adapt to those different coping mechanisms and we make sure that um, the patient um, feels as if they're, they're managing the loss and getting through this time um, as best as they can. Um, each family grieves differently. Um, particularly the mothers and um, sometimes they like to vocalize things sometimes they like to talk about their pregnancies and their experiences that they have and sometimes they like to internalize more and just like us to be a shoulder to cry on or a hand to hold and and we accommodate them in in whichever way um, that they would prefer um, we also provide families um, with the keepsakes um, that we have available to us. We can do pictures for families, um, we can provide outfits, we can provide other resources that they may take home and cherish. Um, and, and so our role is really to support them in however they feel they need to cope. Many families do want to hold infants um, once they are born um, because that's really their time to bond with, the, with their baby and really imprint those memories in their heart so that they always have something to look back on and a time that they spent um, with that baby. You know, losing an infant is probably the hardest thing that anyone um, has to go through. And um, we just, you know, want to provide what we can to those families and um, help them really instill that memory of that child in their heart. That's a wonderful thought about uh, the memory and the caring and, uh, of the, and the support of a family during those tough times. Welcome back to On Call. Tonight we have Dr. Keith Hansen with Sanford Health Fertility and Reproductive Medicine and Dr. Mike McHale with the Avera Medical Group McHale Institute as our guests. Please call in your questions about tonight's topic. Call 1-888-376-6225. You can also email them to oncalltelevision.com, questions at. Uh, we have a, a question, a caller from unknown, advised not to have children 50 years ago because of RH blood issues. Has this changed? What happened? What was this all about, Mike? I think back then they were worried about uh Oh, immunization, I mean, Rogam and you know, stuff like that, so you yeah. wouldn't have a problem down the line. That, that's, that's all changed over time. That's, that's been taken e care of. Explain the RH factor issue about pregnancy and if, if, you're, if you're, you have an RH positive and the baby has an RH, I mean, put us in that story. The question, are you gonna be making antibodies? So, I mean, is it, are you gonna make an antibody that's gonna react against the baby? So basically, it's, it's an antibody problem. Or anything else. By taking the Rogam, which you give, uh, it gets rid of the antibodies, so you don't have that problem anymore. It's it, it's an old problem that doesn't happen. It anymore. doesn't happen anymore. Keith, can I add to that? Well, that's exactly like he was saying. It's from the you know what happens is there's a, f a fetal maternal bleed. The baby somehow loses a little bit of blood into the mother, and if the baby's Rh positive and the mother's Rh negative, then she can make antibodies. Antibody. And that's what Dr. McHale was saying is that the Rogam will block that response because it basically will block the antigens and so then the mother won't be exposed. Um, and because of Rogam, it's very rare to see RH isoimmunization anymore. Right. If it happens though, there's some things we can do, you know, that are, that have really been developed over time to help the baby. To, to keep the baby from racing. From getting so anemic and high drops. So what happens is a mother attacks the mm -hmm. baby's blood and the baby gets sick, right. but we can block that there. Right. So right. We can give them blood, if we have to, we can go and give them blood transfusions. And within the uterus. Right, within the uterus to the baby. We if had we one question about strokes within the uterus. I'm wondering if that means something along the lines of separation or clots along the where the baby connects with the uterus. Let's explain what, how does the baby, what is the amniotic sac and this whole story, explain that. Well, the placenta, you I know, mean, that's is, the placenta, that's what I mean. Yeah, the placenta, the way it works is, it kind of, you know, infiltrates into the uterine wall and then it, the mother sort of bleeds around the cotyledons and that's how the baby gets its nourishment is from that bleeding. In fact, that's why when they clot that the baby can't get its nourishment or its oxygen and dies. And the, what's interesting, though, is the decidua 
of the uterus is actually what keeps the placenta from invading through. Otherwise, it acts a lot like a cancer. And so the, you have to have the decidua of the uterus to keep that placenta in there. What is and the decidua? I mean, okay, so th this, this is, again, the most magnificent story if you look at the, the thing of pregnancy. So the lining of the uterus, there is this decidua that prevents the invasion of the omentum into the wall of the, the uterus. Now, what is this decidua? Just a, uh, cells around the inside of the uterus. It sloughs once a month. Well, no, they don't. Those parts don't slough, but the part above it does, you know, and that part remains. But that's just kind of a, that and it's part of the, the, the reaction of the endometrium is what prevents the placenta from invading through. In fact, we see some problems, you know, like in a woman that's had a C-section, sometimes the placenta can grow through that or the, there's been that, a disruption. Into the scar tissue because yeah. it doesn't have the decidua to protect it. Mm -hmm. Mike, anything to add? Just clots, you start having clots, and then the placenta dies off is what happens. And you know, certain women are gonna be prone to having clots. Okay, so clotting is such an issue. Uh, here's the number one, it's up in the, it's one of the very common causes of maternal death during pregnancy. Not the baby dying, but the mm -hmm. mom dying. And that's why it's so critical, you know, that, that we have, you know, that we manage them very aggressively because it can so, I mean, kill you know, the mom. I know that it kills people. I see how clotting kills people. I've had patients die from blood clots to the lung and mm -hmm. uh, a saddle emboli or a terrible tragic death on a patient of mine uh, after a knee fracture. Uh, and, and you know all of this wonderful balance that our body does of not bleeding too much but not clotting too much and just keeping that perfect balance uh, when we're injured or, or when we're delivering babies, not to, not to bleed to death because we can clot, but then not to clot so much that we die from it. Surgical standpoints now, they have pathways. I mean, a lot of orthopedic procedures, you have a pathway afterwards. You're gonna be on a, you know, injectable anticoagulant for X number of days, and they've shown by doing that, you, you, know, you cut down the risk of death or problems from clots at that point in time. So I mean, those surgical process. But then you increase the risk of bleeding, and then they end up with all of these hematomas around their 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 surgeries. And <laughs> but statistically, it's better to have a hematoma than to have a pulmonary embolus. Yes, or something it like is. That. <laughs> a blood clot to the lung? No. A little bit of bruising? Okay. Yep. A fascinating story. And they do right after they deliver. You start them on for what? How many weeks? Right. Someone's yeah. hypercoagulable. They'll be on anticoagulation up to the day before, the day of, and then they have to go on uh, anticoagulation for six weeks afterwards because the hormones are going so wild. I mean, some of the there's a one uh, disease called five Leiden, which is just terrible with estrogens. I mean, you you don't want to have five Leiden and get estrogens because it causes you to clot. I mean, if you have five Leiden, uh, say heterozygous one copy, and you're on birth control pills. Uh, estrogens that way is about a 35 times higher risk of having a clot. Okay. I have a question. What do doctors do for women who want to become pregnant in the late 40s? Did I ask that already? I didn't. No, you didn't. Yes, what do you think? Well, it depends Can a lot on. Well, first of all, they cannot get pregnant usually with their own eggs. They, there is a chance. I mean, it's, it's all a matter of likelihood. You know, a woman that's once they get above about 42 to 44, the chances of a successful conception go down markedly. So a lot of like the people that you read about in the magazines, you know, the movie stars who yeah. get pregnant and have a baby at 48 or 50, they're usually getting a younger woman to donate eggs and then having those eggs fertilized with her husband's sperm and then they're carry the, carrying the pregnancy that way. All right, So that's an important, because the, all of the problems that happen is those, those eggs get older. Right. Uh, does using contraceptives have any negative effects on a woman's getting pregnant later on in life? I used to say to, that was one of my fears, mm -hmm. that taking birth control mm -hmm. pills might affect their ability to get pregnant later. Is that true or false? Well, most of the time, actually it's not true, it's false. It depends though on what you're talking about. If you're talking about like a IUD and they get a bad pelvic infection, then that's not good. On the other hand, if you're talking about the birth control pills in somebody that has polycystic ovary syndrome where they're not ovulating, they could develop endometrial cancer in the meantime. While if they're on the birth control pill, it'll keep it suppressed. If they have endometriosis, it'll keep it suppressed and it will actually, then when they stop them, they'll um, be able to get pregnant. One, or hopefully help them to get pregnant. One of the things that I find a lot is that patients will come in and say, 
you know, I stopped the pill and now I'm not having periods so I can't get pregnant because they're not ovulating. Well, then you, you sit and you say, well, why, why did you take the pills in the first place? Because my I wasn't getting a period. Well, it's, that was the wrong uh, that, <laughs> no, no. I mean, it's the re, you know the reason they were on it is the same. Now that they stopped it, it didn't cure their ability, problem their the problem in the first place, but it probably kept them from developing a real bad problem. Mm -hmm. And so a lot of times, is it can be protective towards fertility. To so it can even be protective. Right. Uh, that's interesting. Now let's talk about polycystic uh, ovaries. That's an interesting story. Uh, so I'm treating a person who is uh, diabetic, a little overweight, uh, and she gets pregnant. With, and I'm giving her a diabetic pill. Explain that. Well, just, um, I just got a, a, a note from the NIH. They're going to change the name. Polycystic ovaries are going to change the name. Oh, they're going to change it. Yeah, because they feel it doesn't really reflect what it truly means. You know, because it makes everybody think that they have a lot of cysts in their ovaries. Yeah. When in reality, what it is is it's a microscopic little cyst that are under the, the tunica albuginea of the ovary. So when you look at it under the microscope, it looks like there's lots of cysts. But in reality, they don't have a lot of cysts. The, the thing, though, is um, women with polycystic ovaries, of course, if they have diabetes, because they're, they are insulin resistant and the tendency to develop that, um, when they become pregnant, it's very critical that their glucose levels be under very tight control right. because it puts them at higher risk of birth defects, miscarriages, and other complications. Very important issue on diabetes. We're running out of time. Question about celiac disease. Will a gluten-free diet help increase sperm count? Either one of you know that answer. I don't know that, but in a woman, it'll help her. Um, it'll help a lot, and I, it would probably help sperm, I would think. I would think so, yes. Tobacco and sperm, what about other recreational drugs on the effect of sperm? Probably not a good idea. Not a good idea. Yeah, I mean. Yeah, in general. Yeah, marijuana, in general. Marijuana, you know, any data on marijuana and, and uh, sperm and, or ovaries or any of that? No, but I would think it'd be similar to tobacco. I mean, right. think if you're smoking it. I mean. And thyroid, does ha thyroid have anything to do with pregnancy? Yes. Yes. What, and you want it to be in good balance? Definitely. So, okay. and how do you do that? You test them and you test give them. them just the right amount of thyroid and it balances, makes a lot of difference. Exactly. All right. Uh, we'll be back in a minute. South Dakota is still at the widespread flu activity level. The new official statistics will not be released until Friday, but we're told there are many more cases, hospitalizations, and deaths. This is one of the earliest starts to flu season on record. Most years it doesn't peak until February and March. I can't encourage you enough to get your flu shot. It makes a difference. Would you agree? 2012 behind us. Our thoughts turn to romance. That's right. We're entering a time of year symbolized by none other than the flu bug. Did you know flu season usually doesn't peak until February, sometimes even later? Why take chances? It's not too late to get vaccinated, because stopping the flu starts with you. And especially important if you're pregnant to get the flu shot. Absolutely. Very, very critical. In fact, they showed that, it, that in the first trimester, what it does is lowers the rate of stillbirth in mothers. And there was one study that showed that if you have a febrile illness, especially influenza in the last half of pregnancy, increases the risk of autism. All right. Well, well, as a father of four, I have shared the responsibility for raising our now adult kids with a marvelous spouse and also with a community of relatives, friends, neighbors, teachers, coaches, church counselors, doctors, and so on. Certainly the parenting experience has, for me, been one of the most challenging and yet rewarding of life experiences. And the love, joy, and worry doesn't change as these kids grow up. I remember hearing my dad utter a similar comment. I should add, some couples elect not to do the parent thing, knowing the call to parenting is something they simply do not want to take on. I believe that option is a reasonable decision, as parenting can be more demanding and heartbreaking than any other experience in life. There's something about human nature so powerful that a parent would rather give up her or his own life than see their child suffer. 
And as a physician, I have had to watch parents helpless at the bedside with their sick or dying child. It turns my blood cold to see it. But most parents would probably agree the joy is worth the risk. As Garth Brooks sings, I could have missed the pain, but I'd have had to miss the dance. This overwhelming wish to parent doesn't always bring babies, however. We know that try as they might, something like 12% of women in the childbearing age have trouble getting or staying pregnant and that infertility is caused one-third of the time by male problems, one-third by female, and one-third by a combination. Many of these couples still become fertile, sometimes by simply improving lifestyles of both the mother and the father, such as avoiding smoke, exercising more, but not too much, eating better, and maybe just giving it more time. After that, sometimes an exploration for causes, followed by complex and often expensive treatment with medicinal and surgical methods is required. Well, the final and maybe most important point is this. If these methods don't work, there is always adoption. As a parent of one adopted child, I can say that the love, the joy, and the worry is exactly the same as the non-adoption kind of parenting. So for all those yearning for a child, remember that there are parentless kids out there who could really benefit from somebody like you. Garth Brooks' words would work just the same. I could have missed the pain, but I'd have had to miss the dance. We have a minute and a half that we can chat about anything we've said tonight. Uh, I'm just throwing it at you guys. Any, Mike, any comments that you want to make sure we, we remember out there? The current miscarriages, we for the most part can fix those. I mean, find out what's wrong. I mean, yes, some women still do have miscarriages no matter what you do, but uh, it's nothing better than you get called to the hospital and someone's delivered their first child. They've had three miscarriages and you walk in and they're beaming and said, when do you want to do this again? and they kind of smile at you, but they're just happy they've had it done. It's just fun to go in and watch them do that. And I agree, I mean, I think there's a lot of things that we can now do that we couldn't do 10 years ago, and there's more we can do than, you know, at this point in time. Um, and as you already mentioned, the importance of a healthy lifestyle and avoiding all those toxic substances out there can definitely improve getting pregnant, but also staying pregnant and then being able to you know, have a nice, healthy baby. And so that's our goal, of course, is to have a nice, healthy baby. And, uh, and we can do that most of the time. Yes, definitely. So, so, well, I, you know, this is, here we have a hematologist, oncologist. I call you all the time for cancer patients and an OBGYN specialist uh, in fertility together, and it's such an odd couple, I must say. <laughs> but a joy for us and a wonderful, uh, a wonderful topic. This brings us a, to close our fertility and blood clot show. I sincerely thank our studio guest, Dr. Keith Hansen, a fertility expert with Sanford Health Fertility and Reproductive Medicine in Sioux Falls, and Dr. Mike McHale, a hematologist with the Avera Medical Group McHale Institute in Sioux Falls, for helping answer all of the wonderful questions you gave us from the audience. Next week, On Call will present an encore presentation of a very informative program about breast cancer. Two weeks from tonight, we will be back live in the studio answering your questions about all things dermatologic. So get your questions ready and be sure to join us then. I can't encourage you enough to visit the website BeWellSouthDakota.com. It's chock full of information and suggestions that can help you improve your daily lifestyle. And every once in a while, you might see something from us on there too. This is BeWellSouthDakota.com. In 1894, one of our favorite authors, Mark Twain, wrote in his notebook, familiarity breeds contempt and children. Until next time, stay healthy out there, people.
Funding for On Call is provided in part by... Avera is a proud sponsor of On Call on South Dakota Public Broadcasting. Larson Manufacturing is proud to support On Call, starting its 11th year of opening doors for important medical information. And by the South Dakota Foundation for Medical Care, the Medicare Quality Improvement Organization for South Dakota. Additional funding provided by Dakota Care, Regional Health, the Brookings Health System, Dr. Mark Bubach with Dakota Allergy and Asthma, the South Dakota American College of Physicians, and Swiftel Communications. Closed captioning for On Call is provided by the generous support of Avera, the Brookings Health System, and Fishback Financial Corporation.